All right, for part two, we're going to be looking at the next uh, little bit here of the Crash Course on Stars. We read through the preface, and here's the contents. You see a little bit of what we have in store. And um, we're actually going to start with our solar system and the stars on the wall. Humanity, our solar system, is moving somewhere in a spiral arm of our galaxy, together with what Ra called the stars on the wall. As guessed, there are 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. And when Ra talks about the stars on the wall, he doesn't talk about the wall of the universe, and not even about the wall of that Orion Cygnus spiral arm we, where we live in. The wall is experienced by concentrating meditating and contemplating on the night sky. It's a byproduct of the limitations of the, quote, naked eye. Seen from Earth by naked eye, humans experience a wall. In that way, humans are able to see perhaps 8,000 stars, depending on all kinds of conditions. All kinds of conditions. And all those stars seem to be fixed against a wall. We built an eye-related home, so to say, for ourselves. In that context, Rock calls constellations of stars poster girls. Fixed stars. The stars against that, quote, wall seem to be two-dimensional objects fixed against that wall. Fixed stars. To realize yourself, humans can't see the huge density of stars full of light, although not without certain tools. In the 90s, the pictures of the Hubble telescope astonished the astronomical world. In the coming three to four years, its successor, the James Webb Space Telescope, will be a real influencer by changing perspective on our position in the world and in the universe. By the way, totally relating to the birth of the human design system. Interesting point from Jan van Denberg, our author here. And this is, of course, Crash Course on Stars. So all these stars were believed to be fixed to a giant, gigantic celestial sphere which twirled in a stately dance around the Earth every single day. The ancients called them also fixed stars to distinguish them from the planets or wanderers. Wandering Star, a great Portishead song. In that sense, fixed stars appear to be stationary relative to the Earth and to each other although they do travel due to the precession of the equinoxes at a rate of plus or minus 0 0.84 degrees, less than one minute per year, or I guess, sorry, 0 0.84 minutes. So 84% of one arc minute. So needing some 71.4 years to move slightly one degree of arc. The stars maintain fixed positions relative to each other as they move nightly across the heavens, as if the sky dome were rotating around Earth. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. It's a very interesting, interesting thing. You know, I mean, this is, this is really nice. He has some images which I have on rotation uh, because they're kind of cut off on the other side, uh, but they are rotating through uh, in the bottom right hand of the corner. The precession of the equinox. It appears to be the so-called precession of the equinox, creating the illusion of that slow relative move of the stars across the sky. To say it's all geocentric orientation with the eyes establishing this view. It is all geocentric orientation with the eyes establishing this view. This observable, observable phenomena of the rotation of the heavens. The cycle of approximately 25,920 years, over which time the constellations appear to slowly rotate around the Earth, plus or minus 21, uh, 2,160 years per zodiac sign. Oh, I, I guess that the plus and minus symbol is simply stating it takes 2,160 years to get through one zodiac sign at this rate, which makes the age of Aquarius start in about the year 2600 common era. 
though the roots for that age are already growing. Fomalhalt in Pisces Austrinus. So the real age of Aquarius, he's saying, is starting, you know, 500 years from now. 600 years from now. Star-wise, for a next era, it should mean that the constellation Aquarius is the starting point of spring, where now Pisces is seen. Oh, interesting. So Aquarius becomes the starting point for spring in the new era. That's the age of Aquarius. Now it makes sense. So the astrologers in 100 to 200 AD, the time of the coming shift from Aries, or I guess the, the shift at that time from Aries to Pisces, decided that Aries should be the vernal equinox, the start of spring, while the zodiac signs in their keynoting were heavily related upon seasonal activities and calendrical events. So that's why it all starts at zero degrees Aries. The geographic pole star the ecliptic poles are among the most stable of all features of the Earth. Over the 25,920-year processional period, um, an evolutionary round in rave cosmology is about 19,775 years, with six epochs of each 3,296 years, giving eight cycles of approximately 412 years each, like the 1615 to 2027 cycle that we are experiencing now. The next cycle, 2027 to 2438, is the last cycle of its round. So we're in the next to last cycle of the round. We're entering in to the last cycle of the round. And these are, of course, 412 year cycles. And uh, there are eight cycles per epoch and then six epochs per round. Pretty interesting. It'd be interesting to study those, those numbers there. But over the 25,920-year processional period, the north and south celestial poles gyrate in a small circle of 23.4 degrees radius around their respective ecliptic poles. Polaris, the nowadays pole star, best approaches the pole until 2102, until a quarter of a degree apart, so around 80 years from now, after which they will separate. In 1100 BCE, that is, before Common Era, the North Pole passed within seven degrees of Kochab, while in ancient Egyptian times, 2700 before Common Era, Thuban in the constellation Draconis was prominent. The focus is mostly on the North Pole, while of course a similar movement also happens for the South Pole, where currently Polaris Australis is closest, however barely visible to the naked eye. Brightness and magnitude, 5.45. The magnetic pole. To be clear, there is also, of course, a magnetic pole. In short, to not overload this overview, there is a rapid shift of this magnetic pole in recent times. Researchers believe two massive blobs of molten iron in Earth's outer core may have spurred the runaway pole, and there's no telling where it will end up. Life is all about movement, changing patterns, so take your seat and seatbelt. All right, um, that's, yeah, Jan van Denberg. That's just really incredible work. I mean, from Jan, I, I love Jan's work. I love his analysis. I love all the work he's doing here. I mean, it's an interesting point, the shifting magnetic pole, uh, the geographic pole star, and what is what is the pole star of the era? That was interesting, like Kochab being around 1100 BC, Thuban around 2700 BCE. I don't necessarily have associations to these stars, so it'd be interesting to study them and to see if they kind of match up, and I think that that is what he's going to do, so I'm really excited about that. Um, I see, yeah, I mean, it's just interesting to see these kind of archetypal movements, and uh, I love how as certain planetary archetypes are discovered or as certain shifts take place, we see, just like clockwork, this incredible, beautiful clockwork, um, the discovery of Uranus and the advent of the nine-centered being and right variable consciousness, feeling consciousness, the projector, and the discovery of Neptune and sort of the burgeoning awareness of spiritualism. I mean, I, I was having the thought that the Civil War, called the War of Ghosts, because so many people had ghostly experiences in the War of Spirits and the rise of spiritualism, well, you have Neptune being discovered and then the people are just barely old enough to go off to war and in, you know, and they're in their 20s after the war, in their 30s, 
after the war and they're having all these ghost experiences because this was the first generation to be born after Neptune was discovered, right? And so it's always interesting to see the first generation. People always ask me what's going to happen in 2027 and I say, well, babies are going to be born in 2027 that will then become adults that will have nothing to do with us, right? In the sense of having nothing to do with um, the world we, that we live in right now. But, you know, that's that's what's so interesting. It's really, it's that we're, we're really seeing, when we look at these macro level cosmological kind of things, we're seeing these macro shifts, which sort of indicate when someone is born in a certain era and what they have access to. And those of us born in the Uranian era, we have access to uh, Uranus as a, as a programming agency and sort of the Uranian faculties. And those, that first generation that was born after the discovery of Neptune, um, you know, and the first generation born after the discovery of Pluto, people born in the 1930s, 1940s, it's interesting. Great psychologists like Carl Jung got to live into the age of Pluto and got to see the age of Pluto, but were forerunners of it, right, uh, in some sense. So, yeah, it's interesting, and I, I see that Jan van Denberg is mentioning Fomalhaut in Pisces Austrinus, and he's saying that that is really the star for the next age. That is the Aquarian star, that is the Rave star, um, and he's making some really interesting points. So, yeah, I'm really excited, uh, really, really excited to read more of this book, so stay tuned, and we will continue with our bedtime stories, Crash Course on Stars. Thanks.